Welcome everyone to uh, our funding your KU education session with this uh, Explore Graduate School Week. Uh, my name is Amanda Ostrico and I am the Assistant Vice Provost and Director of Graduate Enrollment Management. And I am really excited to kick off uh, our last general session for this week. Uh, Cheyenne Queen from our Financial Aid and Scholarships Office um, is here to present most of your presentation today. I'm just going to do a really quick um, introduction and overview uh, I want to remind everyone uh, certainly to put question, questions in the chat throughout the presentation. Uh, I'll answer any that I can as they come up, although I expect Cheyenne will probably have to answer most of them. Uh, and so when we get to the end, we'll have time for questions, uh, at which time we'll make sure that any questions that are in the chat are addressed, as well as um, anyone who wants to go ahead and unmute their mic, unmute their mic and ask questions then. Uh, so just a quick uh, overview of what funding looks like for, for graduate students. Um, and I talked a little bit about this yesterday, uh, if, if anyone was able to attend yesterday's presentation. But I do wanna spend just a couple of minutes providing uh, some details on the types of different funding that graduate students tend to utilize for their, their, their studies. So there are uh, what we call um, GRA, GTA, or GA positions. So graduate research assistantships, graduate teaching assistantships, and graduate assistantships. So 3G appointments are often what those are referred to. Um, so that's, that, that's one category I'll talk about more in just a minute here. There are scholarships and fellowships. There are other forms of sponsorships, uh, loans, and then certainly uh, other types of financial aid. So the three G appointments that I mentioned, uh, th 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 those are uh, employment, and so those are positions where students receive a biweekly stipend. There, there's health uh, and workers' compensation benefits, and then there are tuition benefits. And those tuition benefits are dependent on uh, your appointment percentage or how many hours um, you're hired to work each week. So, for example, a typical appointment is 50%, and so if you have a 50% appointment, that means that you're hired to work on average 20 hours a week. Um, you know out of the normal 40 hour work week. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, fellowships and scholarships and other sponsorships that students utilize. Uh, and those might come from a particular program, from the school, um, from the university or from uh, employers or other outside groups. And then there's also loans and other forms of financial aid. Uh, and so I'll, one of the things I, I always uh, highlight as really important um, when you're looking at your, your, your prospective program that you're interested in is that um, you know, on their website or in, their, in their application materials, if, if they don't indicate what those options for funding are, um, that you should really feel comfortable reaching out to the program and asking them how they typically fund their students. Uh, and so that's a point where I would recommend starting with uh, the graduate program coordinator. Most programs have a staff member who serves in that graduate coordinator role, um, and that's a really great first point of contact. So I'm going to go ahead and put um, a link in the chat where you'll be able to find um, information about the application process for whichever program you're interested in, and uh, most of the time that also has that, that information for that program coordinator. Um, so while I do that, I will turn it over to Cheyenne to walk you through the financial aid process. Perfect. Thank you, Amanda. So um, as Amanda mentioned, my name is Cheyenne Queen, and I am one of the financial aid counselors here at KU. Um, so as we are going through today, I just really want you guys to be able to um, really kind of understand looking at costs for KU, looking at your FAFSA, looking yeah, at your aid options, and other things that you guys can look into as well. So the first thing here is we always wanna talk about costs. That's a big part of when you're looking into a graduate program. And here at KU, I think we do a really, really good job of being transparent for exactly how much it costs to have your education here at KU. And we do this on our financial aid website. So you guys can follow this link. And again, this link will be posted. So um, you guys can always go back and find this link. And also it's on our website. Um, but this is where we go over the costs that are, you know, can contribute to graduate education. So we talk about tuition and fees. We talk about room and board, if that applies to you all, books and supplies, and then all of these kind of personal and transportation expenses that can go into being a graduate student. And all of that comes together and it makes your cost of attendance or your budget to be a student at KU. And what this does is this is basically your cap for how much it costs for you to get an education here at KU. So this is basically how much financial aid you can have. And when we're going into a budget, 
we look at a whole bunch of different things. So on that previously slide, you know, we looked at tuition and fees, we look at the books, so those are all normal. But also within your cost of attendance, we want to be able to adjust for things for you as a student. And so there are certain things that when we're looking at a cost of attendance, we can adjust for. And most of this is, you know, things that happen in your personal life. So um, outside of just being a student and having tuition and fees, being a student also includes, you know, medical expenses or purchasing technology or transportation expenses if you're commuting to and from campus. And so we want to take that stuff into account when we are looking at your budget as a student. So if you have any of these things, I would always suggest reaching out to your financial aid counselor and just asking if this is something that we can adjust your budget for. Now, when we are doing adjustments, it doesn't always mean that you're going to be eligible for more in financial aid. So there are certain types of financial aid, and we're going to go over that a little bit later. Um, so when we're adjusting a budget, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have more financial aid. But what it does is it allows you more room to borrow more financial aid to help cover some of those costs. So the very first thing when we talk about financial aid, what you guys want to do is we always want to start with the FAFSA. So the FAFSA is that document that you guys are going to put um, certain different tax information in, you're going to put financial asset information, and that determines what aid a student is eligible for. So when you are looking at starting to a graduate program, whatever fall you guys would be starting in, you always want to use two years prior on the FAFSA, and we call that prior prior year. So when you guys, you know, if you're looking at starting graduate school in the fall of 2021, on the FAFSA, it's going to ask that you use 2019 tax information. So that is the prior prior year, so, so two years prior, and then it's just going to ask for general information. So your name, your address, your social security number. There are a few tips when you're filing the FAFSA that we always want to go over, and that is we always want you guys to be able to apply early and apply each year. So the FAFSA opens October 1st of the previous year. So if you were starting in fall 2021, that FAFSA would open in October of 2020. So you have until that time to be able to file the FAFSA. That gives you plenty of time to correct things or, um, you know, if you got an error on the FAFSA, it lets you know. So you guys have plenty of time to do that. Um, one of the things that you always want to make sure that you're doing is that you're entering your name and your social security number exactly as they appear in your social security card. And that may seem like a, a duh thing, right? Like we know we got to put our name how we spelled it. Um, but mistakes happen. And I have the perfect mistake with a social security number and I don't mind sharing it because it is my own. Um, so when I was applying to school for my undergraduate degree and I was filing the FAFSA, my FAFSA kept getting rejected and I didn't know why. It kept saying that I was not the person who I was and I thought you guys, I thought I was going to uncover some some real deep queen family stuff and some information into like my past life but really all it was is that my name was spelled wrong on my social security card and so it was one letter off on my social security card but everything was being rejected because it didn't match so things like that can happen i had to go get a no, new social security card before i could file the fafsa so little things like that can make your fafsa either have rejections or not file so filing early always helps solve those issues and you have plenty of time to do so the other thing that if you are able to use the IRS data retrieval tool on the FAFSA, I certainly encourage you to do so. What that does is that tool will automatically bring your financial information or your tax return information directly from the IRS website. That way you don't have to go through and enter income and assets and you know, wages and taxes, you don't have to enter that manually. Instead, it just brings it all over for you. It also helps in the long run if a student gets selected for verification. We already know that it came directly from the IRS website, so we already know that it's correct. After you file the FAFSA, there are a few things that you guys would be eligible for in terms of aid. And so there's four main areas that we are going to go over. Um, ones that are really nice, grants and scholarships, and then those three G's that Amanda was talking about, work study, and then the ones that maybe aren't so nice, loans, which unfortunately every student is eligible for. So in terms of graduate school, 
when we look at grants and scholarships, unfortunately, there are no, there's no federal help when it comes to grants and scholarships for a student in graduate school. They leave that all to the undergrad. So if you guys were an undergrad and you had a Pell Grant or you had a state grant, that is all out the window, unfortunately. So really when you're talking about grants and scholarships within a graduate school, you want to reach out to your department or your school that you're studying with. That eligibility is all through them. So they look at your applications. They look at how many students they have coming. They look at how many funds they have to award students. So they have all of that information. So you definitely want to have a conversation with the department that you would be studying with to see if that's something you are eligible for. If this is the only aid that you want, you don't have to file the FAFSA, but some FAFSA or some scholarships, excuse me, are going to require the FAFSA. So that's something that you want to ask your department as well. And once a department awards a student, so they award them a grant or they award them a scholarship, they let us know and then we would add that to your financial aid package. One of the other grants that I always want to share with graduate students is um, the child care grant and this is something through KU. And so if you are a graduate student and you're enrolled in at least six hours here at the Lawrence campus, you have an EFC or an expected family contribution number of 13,000 or less. And what that EFC is or the expected family contribution, that is the number from the FAFSA that generates what aid a student is eligible for. So after you enter all your income information, it jets out this number and that lets us know what you're eligible for. For graduate students, that EFC really doesn't do anything because the only federal thing you're going to be offered is a loan. So we really are looking at specific scholarships or grants that require that EFC to be a certain level. And the child care grant does that. Um, so then if you have a child that's younger than five, not in kindergarten, so this would be something that you are paying child care for, um, that you can prove that you pay child care expenses, you may be eligible for this grant. So this always opens around September, and it's on the KU scholarship portal, which is the KUacademicworks.com. And so that is something that you guys can look into as well. And the award amounts vary, you know, each year, depending upon how much funding KU has to award these depends on how much a student is awarded. The next type of aid is um, what Amanda went over a little bit earlier. So those three G's are those graduate teaching assistants, graduate research assistants, or graduate assistants. And because we like to shorten everything in financial aid, we just call them the three G's. Um, so this is where you really do want to reach out to your graduate program and look at those listings. Um, like Amanda said, you are eligible to have some or all of your tuition paid including any differential tuition. So differential tuition really would be if the school or department that you're studying with has course fees or additional fees on top of tuition, you may be eligible to have that covered if you're in one of these three G's. How these three G's apply to your financial aid is it's basically a discount or a waiver that is applied to your tuition and it's posted directly to your bill. So it isn't anything that has like, they don't come from a specific fund. So it's basically something that will reduce your tuition. So after you enroll in classes, you're gonna be assessed tuition and then that waiver applies, which would be discounted off your tuition. Um, how much you receive obviously affects your position. So like Amanda was talking about, whether you are 50% or lower, that determines how much you will have. And then the benefit is also determined by your um, department that you're studying with. Other scholarships that you guys can look into, um, we always want to share any private scholarships that are out there. So on our website specifically, which is affordability.ku.edu, we have a scholarship tab and that has a link for private slash outside scholarships, as well as a few other KU ones. And so I always encourage students to look at private slash outside scholarships because um, really all it does is it just lowers the amount that you may have to take out into a loan. So I would suggest looking at all of these. Um, the graduate website has a really cool um, one where it talks about funding sources. And then that last one there is that academicworks.com, which is that KU scholarship portal. So I would start looking now. And then this is something that you can even look in, you know, when you are a graduate student, because they change um, every so often as new scholarships appear, they'll get updated. 
Um, the last thing here um, that we always want to talk about, unfortunately, are the loan options. So sometimes it's not always the financial aid that we want, but it is something that will help cover those costs. And as a graduate student, you have three options for student loans. Two are federal loans and one is a private loan, which would be through a bank or a, a credit union or a loan lender. So the first loan that you're going to be offered if you file the FAFSA is an unsubsidized direct loan. So just like an undergraduate, um, you know, when you're working on your undergrad, you're eligible for loans. It's basically the same loan, except it's a little bit more of an, a higher amount and a little bit higher of an interest rate. So all graduate students are eligible for up to $20,500 in an unsubsidized direct loan. Um, that is something that once you file the FAFSA, you're automatically approved for it. There is no extra application. There is no credit check. Every student, as long as they file the FAFSA, is eligible for this. Um, this, the amount that you get would be determined by your cost of attendance that we talked about earlier. So your budget to be a student here and then minus any other aid. So if you had any grants, any scholarships, any of those three G's, that would determine how much you would be offered in this unsubsidized loan. The next loan that you can look at is a graduate plus loan. So I don't know if you guys remember when you were in an undergrad, there's an option for a parent plus loan that your parent can take out to help pay for your education. Well, when you become a graduate student, you're automatically independent on the FAFSA. And so that parent plus loan option goes away. So instead, what the federal government does is they make this a graduate plus loan option. So this would be a loan that you can take out in your name. It is a federal loan and there is no limit. So it's something that you can take out on top of that unsubsidized loan. I would always take out as much as you can in an unsubsidized loan before you looked at the graduate plus option. It has a little bit of a higher interest rate. You do have to apply for a credit check. So not every graduate student is eligible for a graduate plus loan. It does depend on that credit and it does depend on your credit history. Um, so this would be something that if maybe we didn't have a lot of scholarships, maybe we didn't have one of the three G's and we needed a little bit more than that 20,500, this would be something that you can look into. The next couple of things would be private loans. And these are loans that are not federally affiliated. And so KU does have a specific one that's with KU and it's with the KU Endowment Office. And so KU Endowment created this awesome student loan program for students who maybe have, you know, a little bit less of a balance that they need to get covered. They made it pretty similar to federal student loans, in my opinion. You know, they're deferred while you're at KU. The interest rate is only slightly higher than those federal loans. Um, and while it's deferred at KU, you've got 10 years to pay it back. So they follow the repayment plans of federal student loans pretty quickly, or pretty closely, excuse me. So when you look into private loan options, I would always suggest looking into the KU endowment loan first. The other one that you can look into is typically going to have a higher interest rate. So private loans, like I had mentioned earlier, they are through banks or credit unions or loan lenders. And so when we talk about these, they typically have higher interest rates, typically require repayment right away. So we always want this to be a last resort. So unless, I mean, sometimes, you know, when you have a private loan, if you have it through your hometown bank that you've had a while, maybe there is a perk that you can find, but usually this just aren't as nice. And so um, you would go through your lender, typically does require a cosigner dependent upon how much of an income you do have as a student. Um, it does not require the FAFSA. So if you have no interest to file the FAFSA and or you are not eligible to file the FAFSA, this would be something that you could look into to help you pay for your education. Um, you can borrow up to your cost of attendance, just minus any other aid you have. So this would be something if you wanted to have this on top of a grant or a scholarship, you can add that up to your cost of attendance or your budget. timeline for aid so really just kind of wanted to give you guys a brief overview of a timeline it's nothing specific but each semester aid does disperse about 10 days before classes start 
So all of that aid that you have in your cost of attendance or your budget, it is always divided in half for fall and half for spring. Now, sometimes it can be uneven, but most of the time it's pretty even. And 10 days before fall classes, that aid would disperse to go towards your tuition charges and anything else. And then 10 days before your spring classes would start, that aid would disperse and go towards that as well. These are directly applied toward your KU bill. There's nothing that you need to do to make it go towards your charges. It is an automatic process if it's a federal, um, federal state or institutional aid. Um, after your bill is paid, so let's say maybe your tuition was the only thing that you have charges for and it was only $5,000 and you have a $10,000 loan coming for fall. Any of that excess would go directly to be refunded to you. So we are not going to say that you can't borrow more than your charges here. The only thing that you are um, stuck by is that cost of attendance or that budget. Um, but when we are um, looking at that, you can have as much excess and some students will do this and use it for off campus housing or maybe, you know, some charges in their personal life. So you are, um, that is your aid and that will be refunded to you. Those refunds typically are available just a few days before classes start. It takes about a week once aid disperses to have those refunds um, go through. The easiest way to do a refund is typically by setting up direct deposit. And so, um, if you have direct deposit set up with the university, what that means is that refund will just go directly into the bank account that you have set up. Otherwise, it will take a little bit longer and you would get that um, you would get that refund in the mail in a form of a paper check. So just a little bit longer, but still would be coming to you. Lastly, here are just a few other important things to consider. So half-time enrollment is required for most types of federal aid. And so depending upon if you have a 3G or what program you're in, what is considered half-time enrollment for you can change. Most of the time for graduate students, that's five hours. And you have to be in more than that to be eligible for federal aid. So that's something you certainly want to discuss with your advisor in your department. There is also this thing called student or uh, um, satisfactory academic progress. And that is something that we are required by the federal government to track students eligibility for financial aid. So we have to look at students GPA and students completion rate and GPA is just any of your KU courses. We're going to look at that GPA and as long as it's above a 3.0, you're going to be eligible for financial aid. The completion rate, we look at um, we look at the number of classes that you have started versus the number of classes that you have completed. And so as long as that stays above a 67%, you will be eligible for financial aid. We will send an email at the beginning for all students who start in whether it's undergrad or graduate. We always send an email just explaining satisfactory academic progress so that students are aware. And then it is something on our website that you can look into as well. So as long as you are maintaining that GPA and completion rate, you are eligible to have financial aid. We do offer a chance to appeal it. So if something happened in your personal life that, um, you know, maybe you got sick or something happened and you had to miss school, that is an option to appeal it. So we do offer appeals and that would be just something you would want to speak with with myself or another counselor in our office. And also just lastly, you do need to file the FAFSA if you want to receive aid and you'll file it every year that you are a student. Um, and that is about it. So if you guys have any questions, 